Hey church family and welcome to New Sound Online. We are honored that you decided to join us. We are believing that God has a special encounter for you that will leave you encouraged, challenged, and changed. And let me encourage you with this. Engage in this experience with us. Get up and worship. Amen the preacher. Leave us a comment in the chat box so we can chat with you. Intentionally tune your heart into what God has especially for you today, right where you're at. Hey, we love you so much. Come on, let's worship together. I want to dive right into the Word of God together. The first passage of Scripture will be reading them from Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Can I get an amen right there? Come on, I'm telling you, the Bible is good enough in and of itself, all right? <laughs> but hey, I want to draw your attention to those two questions that Jesus posed here in this passage of Scripture. Who do people say I am? Who do you say I am? See, when we ask those questions today, we get a variety of different answers. In my office where I do most of my study, I, can, I have several books about the life of Jesus, the historical Jesus, the Jesus you never knew, the life and times of Jesus the Messiah, Jesus in the pages of history, and so on and so on. To put it mildly, the person of Jesus has left a significant and lasting impact on the world. Scholars have dubbed Jesus as the founder and focal point of the religion that has done more to shape Western culture than any other person. I think that human beings will always have a curiosity about the past that helps shape them, and Jesus will always be a figure of fascination because of that. So as the text we just read, though, demonstrates, as long as there have been people reflecting on who Jesus is, there has been a variety of differing opinions. Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But when Jesus looks at his closest group of followers and friends, the disciples, and he asks them, who do you say that I am? It is those disciples whose lived experience and memories transfer or, or testify to us the person of Jesus. Listen, even if you're not a Jesus follower, the disciple-making, faith-creating impact of Jesus should be acknowledged. It's the indispensable starting point for any search for the Jesus from whom Christianity originated. Historian Tom Holland began his career kind of studying the ancient Greeks and Romans. Um, he was always fascinated by antiquity and then all of its impact. But what he found really shocked him. He says that the ancient world was incredibly cruel and its values totally foreign to him. The murder of imperfect children, the deviation of human sexuality, the bodies of slaves who were treated like outlets for the physical pleasure of those with power. The poor and the weak had no rights. How did we get from there to here? Tom Holland writes, it was Christianity. It was Jesus and his followers. He says, by them, we see the ripple effects of revolution. They, 
followers of Jesus revolutionized sex and marriage. They, they demanded that men control themselves and they, and they prohibited all forms of rape. Christianity confided sexuality with monogamy. Christianity elevated women. In other words, Christianity permeated and transformed the world. See, history can be a great foundational starting point for you and your quest to understand who Jesus is. But for anyone who considers themselves a seeker of truth, the historical gap between the Greeks and the Romans, all the way till the Western world that we experience today, is a place worth exploring to see Christianity's influence and its merit. But you want to know the first people responsible for your view of who Jesus is? It's the first voices you heard in your life. Your family. Whether positively or negatively, in the presence of mom and dad or other caregivers, you first learn about yourself and God. It, see, it was the same for the disciples. At first, they heard about Jesus from the, from the community they were a part of. But when they got close to Jesus and received revelation from him, they were able to make a positive answer to that question. Who do you say that I am? See, make no mistake, it would have been easy for them to just go along with what the community was saying. That Jesus was like John the Baptist or another prophet that God had sent. But no one that followed him for a while, and after their eyes had been open, would ever deny that Jesus was the Messiah. See, when he asked that question, who do I say that I am? Simon Peter answers, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you. Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. You see, I used to think that if I could just go back in time, and I could just live in the days of Jesus, if I could just be there when he roamed the earth, it would have been so much easier to have a courageous faith in God. See, if I could witness the miracles, if I could, if I could walk on the water, if I could see Jesus multiply the loaves and the fishes and, and eat it, if I could be there when he raises someone from the dead, if I could be there when he hung on the cross and died and then three days later rose again, if I could just see it, then I would have this courageous, unshakable faith. I used to think that. But I was wrong. And I like to submit to you if, you, if you think like that, you're wrong as well. Because thousands of people saw Jesus do what the disciples saw him do. The disciples weren't the only ones there when the miracles were taking place. The disciples weren't the only ones there when people were resuscitated from the grave. No, there were crowds of thousands of people there watching Jesus perform these miracles. They witnessed Jesus bring uh, people back from the dead. They witnessed Jesus open blind eyes. They witnessed Jesus heal lame legs. They witnessed Jesus open deaf ears. They witnessed Jesus serving the poor and the prostitutes. They witnessed Jesus die on the cross. And yet they still did not put their faith in Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So what am I saying? I'm saying is that it's God who reveals to you that Jesus is who he says he is. It's God whose loving kindness draws you in to his reality. The reality is this. No one stumbles into the revelation of God. Jesus said that flesh and blood, a.k.a. human beings, had not revealed to his followers who he was, but the Father in heaven, which, which tells us a lot about the activity of God in the world today. What is the Father doing? What is the Father about? What is his heart doing in this world? See, God in his 
character and his nature and his loving kindness looks down at creation. He sees all the people whom he has made and he is eager to unveil his reality to those people. The scandal of Christianity is that God took on flesh and blood and he entered into this world to restore communion with lost humanity. We did not entice him to come. We did not twist his arm. There was nothing all so lovely about us that made God leave his heavenly throne and send his one and only son to us. The fact is, we weren't even looking for Jesus when Jesus came after us. See, we didn't even know that the things that we were deeply searching for were connected to him. Our pursuits of other things like purpose or pleasure or identity were actually cries of our soul to come home to the Father. See, in this confession of Peter, we see the revelation that all humanity must come to. And that is this. Jesus is our Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. See, those words may be confusing to us now in our days, the Messiah and Christ. But in ancient Israel, those were very clear words. And it had a, a long history. See, the Israelites had a hope, a hope that spanned generations throughout their history from Adam and Eve to Noah, to Abraham, to David, to Solomon, to all the prophets, that one day God would restore everything that had gone wrong with the world, that God would return to his people as the king, and he would set up his kingdom in Israel, and he would usher in peace and prosperity. He would have victory over the enemies of God, he would have abundant life in his spirit. There would be harmony among the nations. See, in that day, God would be the deliverer. In that day, God would be the healer. In that day, God would be the warrior. In that day, God would be the cleanser of all unrighteousness. Basically, everything that they had hoped for, God would fulfill. So that word Messiah is what's wrapped up in that reality. That he was, for ancient Israel, the hope of the world. Now let me ask you this. What do you hope for? What are things right now that your heart longs for? See, I don't know what your answer is to that question. But I can tell you this. I know that it is a desired future that you haven't seen yet. I know that's what you hope. You hope... For something, you hunger for something that has not yet come to pass. We live in a world of great hunger and great uncertainty. We, we pursue what we value. We, we hope for what we desire will bring us something in return. Which is why I find the person of Jesus so fascinating. See, Jesus was not like everybody else. He would get up and say to crowds of people, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He would get up and say, I am the light of life. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. He would say to people, whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Over and over again, Jesus would invite people to see him, to experience him, and, see, and to just to see that what all human souls long for is found and fulfilled in him. Jesus offered us and invited us in his grace to see him for who he truly is. You see, in God's grace, we see that he is the forgiveness for all of our sins and our failures. We see that he offers us the perfect life that we could never live. That God offers us his perfect righteousness that we could never live that perfect on our own strength. See, in Jesus Christ, we are made the righteousness of God. In Jesus Christ, we are loved beyond our wildest dreams. The French philosopher Blaise Pascal wrote this, when this, excuse me, what then does this craving and inability cry to us? If not that there was once a true happiness in man. 
of which there now only remains the mark and empty trace. He tries vainly to fill it with everything around him, seeking from things absent the help he does not receive from things present. But they are all inadequate, because only an infinite and immutable object, that is God himself, can fill this infinite abyss. Or I love how St. Augustine said it, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. See, Jesus is the promised deliverer and fulfillment of all the promises of God. If you go back and you read the Old Testament, you see that he fulfilled over 600 prophecies that God had promised and set up Israel to receive their king. And yet most of the Israelites did not recognize him when he came. It came to a small group of 12 that really began to understand Jesus for who he truly is. And that number continued to grow to 120 and to 3,000 to 5,000. It grew and grew and grew. And how Jesus still appears to us today is as our Messiah, is as our promised deliverer and the fulfillment of all that our souls are searching for. He delivers us from our sin. He removes all our shame and guilt and pain. He offers us life and life more abundantly, life that we could never attain in and of ourselves and the things that we search for and that we hope for and that we long for are actually found and fulfilled in him. Our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O oh God. What sets Jesus apart from being a good teacher or a humble activist or a number of the things that people have set upon Jesus to be he is the son of the living God. That's what sets him apart. See, see, Peter recognizes that Jesus is no ordinary man. Jesus is the king. Jesus is the Lord of the world. Jesus doesn't just come on the scene and, and say, whatever you believe about me is okay as long as you're sincere. No, Jesus brings us to the place where we recognize our need for him as our Messiah. And as we see that he fills those deep longing and hopes of our hearts, we see that only God could do that. That it was no ordinary man that's able to bring us a self-help group of teachings. That it's no, other, no ordinary man that's able to pull us up from what our own experiences and our own failures and our own shortcomings bring us to. No, it must be God in the flesh that draws us in and changes everything. Our lives are reordered by the gospel. You see, Jesus showed us what the Father was truly like. The Bible says that he is the radiance of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Translation is, if you want to know what God's like, look at Jesus. Look at the way he treats the poor and the marginalized. Look at the way that he loves the sinners and those far from God. Look at the way that he brings people back to life from their most trying moments, whether they're literally dead or spiritually dead. Jesus goes to them and reveals to us what God is truly like. He's the King and the Lord of the world. See, what I'm saying and what we say here around New Sound Church is that we want to help connect you to everything that God has for your life. But one thing you'll learn about following Jesus is that he leads an upside-down kingdom. Jesus invites you into a greater life, abundant life, a life of fullness, but it's a life where you lay down everything. A life where you lay down everything only to find that you have more than you ever had before. It's so counterintuitive. But how could God be under, ever understood by our intuition or our intellect. He never could be. By definition, he is God. He is not like us. His ways are not like our ways. His thoughts are not like our thoughts. And when Jesus showed up on the scene, he showed us 
the life of the Father. He showed us a life in the Spirit. He showed us what the Son of the living God came to do and accomplish in this world and in the lives of his followers. Which brings me to an important point I want to share with you today. If you don't hear another word that I'm saying, hear what I'm saying right now. And that's this. It is God's revelation that leads to our transformation. God knows more about you than you could ever discover in a thousand lifetimes. David says this, God's thoughts about us are so vast that it outnumbers the grain of sand on the seashore. That's found in Psalm 139. Or how about this? He says, God saw us in our unformed body and our mother's womb. All the days were ordained for us. They were written in his book before one of them came to be. You know, I've discovered that some of the most world-changing, Jesus-loving, and influential people in the world are ordinary people who God took through a process of revealing himself. Just think about it. Think about the stories in the Bible. Think about Abraham in Genesis 12, 1, where he, God shows up to Abraham and says, go to a land that I'll show you. And on that journey, Abraham discovers that God is his shield, that God is faithful, that God provides, that God rewards, that God protects, that God promises and delivers. See, the writer of Hebrews even goes as far to tell us that Abraham reasons that God can even raise the dead even though he never saw it. How did Abraham get to that point? Well, because he was on the process of revelation. He was on that journey. And God revealed to him through his trials and tribulations, through the battles that he faced, that God could be trusted, that God was his shield and exceedingly great reward, that God gave him the promise of the son, and that if God tested him to, to, to say sacrifice Isaac, then he reasoned that God could even raise Isaac from the dead. Not just Abraham, but think about Moses. In Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, God comes and says to Moses, I am Yahweh, the Lord. I appear to Isaac and to Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty, but I did not reveal my name, Yahweh, to them. See, Moses and the Israelites, they began to see God as the master of every nation and of all created things. He is Yahweh. He is the giver of life. He is the breaker of bondages. He is a mighty warrior. He is a consuming fire. Moses didn't know that from the jump. <laughs> Moses had to be taken through a process of seeing God for who he truly is and then leading a whole covenant community of people into experience, experiencing this God with him. And God led them with a pillar of fire, with a cloud by night. I mean, it was an incredible journey that they took. So they did not just get this instant download of revelation of who God was. No, they were on the journey and process of revelation. Let me give you one more. Gideon in Judges chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, when the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. See, up until that point, Gideon was no mighty hero. Gideon had never led an army. Gideon was the self-proclaimed smallest member of the smallest tribe of all of Israel. He had never done anything of significance in his own eyes. But yet God shows up and says, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And God began to show Gideon how he was the warrior that fought Gideon's battles with him and that Gideon could find strength in knowing that Yahweh will always be with him. There are countless stories. Those are just three that I've highlighted. But over and over again, we see this truth. It's God's revelation that leads to our transformation, that God shows up in our lives and does not just give us an instant download of everything that he is and everything that he wants to do in our life. No, God wants to establish us as the man, as the woman that he created us to be. But in order to do that, it's a process of revelation. It's a process of life change. It's a process as you follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. 
You learn how he can be trusted in every area. You learn that he is your shield, that he is your strength, that he is your light, that he is your provider, that he is your protector, that there's nothing that you face in life that God has not already overcome and shown himself as more than enough. See, I love how the Apostle Paul describes his calling from God. He says, I persecuted the church. I tried to destroy it, and I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my forefathers. But God, but God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. See, that's a beautiful thing about your life. It's not performance driven. It's not up to you to pad your resume before God. You're, you're loved now as you will be a thousand years from now when you're with God in eternity and you're made perfect. You're loved now, not then. You are so loved now. You're loved perfectly Allow that to speak to you today. Allow that to free your soul and encourage you to begin the journey with him. God is calling you. God is wanting to reveal to you the ways in which he is your Messiah and the son of the living God. I share this quite frequently with those in my church is that you have two callings in life. Your primary calling, your first calling is to a relationship with Jesus. We see this all over the New Testament. Let me give you just one verse. Second Timothy verse, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 9 through 10. It says this, he saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose in grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time but has now been revealed to the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and who has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. See, this is our primary calling, that we couldn't do anything that merit God coming to us. We, it was not our own doing, not anything that we have done, Paul says, but it was God's own purpose and grace to call us, to come after us, to come to bring us into relationship. Your primary calling in life is to a relationship with Jesus Christ. He wants you. He loves you. God loves you and he wants to be close to you. So much so he moved heaven and earth to get you. He came to earth for you. He wants a relationship with you. That's your primary calling in life. Peter says it this way. God, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous life, that you might declare forth the praise of him. That's your primary calling in life, to be with Jesus. But you also have a secondary calling. And your secondary calling is this. You were called and created to do unique God-appointed things. It's what we see actually in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 where the Bible says that we were created anew in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand in advance that would be our way of life or that we would walk in. See, God did not just save you to sideline you. God saved you for a purpose. God has his own purpose and grace upon your life that from the very beginning of time has been there. And he's been waiting that you would first get a revelation of who he is and that he wants a revel and that he wants a relationship with you. And then secondly, that he wants you to walk in some very specific things, some God appointed things that only you can do. And I will not uh, be done ever preaching this because there's good works that he's prepared in advance for you to walk in. Things that only you can do that I can't do. Things that places and people that only you can reach and impact and influence that God has appointed especially for you to do. And it's not just um, of the spiritual nature, like preaching or in Christian settings. It's in your very work. It's in the things that you create. It's in the relationships that, that you attract. It's in the things that you reflect to this world to give it a reminder of how great a place it is and how glorious of a God that's created it. That's your secondary calling in life. 
I can't wait a little bit more to get into unpack that next week and what it means to have the keys to the kingdom and to have access and authority to do that here on earth. But my friend, I want to invite you, if you've never invited Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life, to be your Messiah, then today is your day. Today is your moment. Don't put it off. Don't wait any longer. You have felt the restlessness in your heart. You have seen that as you've tried in and of yourself to create your own identity, to, to live out your own idea of human flourishing, to put your hopes in things that may or may not work out, you have actually seen in your soul a calling card from God. The call home. The call to see that actually in the Messiah, all your deepest hopes and longings are fulfilled in Him. You're longing for true love. You're longing for real purpose. You're longing for deep and lasting relationships. Not only on this side of eternity, but in the one to come. See, once you're connected with God, he's able to bring all sorts of things into your life, things that you long for, things that you never even thought were possible, he's able to do. I want to invite you, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, today is that day. Today's your moment. And it begins with simply saying this, Jesus, here's my life. I give it to you. Come and be the Lord and Savior of my life. Forgive me of my sin. Remove all of my guilt and shame. And lead me closer to you. It's as simple as that. See, I can give you the words, but only you can give them the meaning. So friend, right now, right where you're at, if that's what you need to do, I want to encourage you in this next moment as we transition into a time of worship to get alone with God and express to him the deep desire of your heart to come into a relationship with him. And for my other friends watching with us today, God wants to reveal to you more of who he is. There's more transformation to come in your life. See, there's a process and a journey that never ends once you become a disciple of Christ. We don't just end up in a level of maturity. No, it's an intentional journey and process of faith. And so I want to invite you, friend. What is one area of your life right now that God may be challenging you? God may be speaking to you. God may be inviting you in to a journey with Him, to be stretched. You know, it's often I hear from people, oh, that's not my ministry. That's not my love language. I could never do something like that. But let me encourage you. God is the God of all time and space. He's a creator. He can create an opportunity for you. He can actually awaken capacities in you that you never knew you had. And so I want to challenge you this week. Is there an area of your life where you've limited God? Is there something that you've people have called out in you? And that you've dismissed time and time again? Maybe that's a good work that God has prepared in advance for you to walk in. Maybe that's part of your secondary calling in life. Maybe there's a journey that God wants to take you on in faith. Maybe it's a, a new job. Maybe it's a transplant to a new city. Maybe it's a fresh start. Maybe God's calling you to start that business. Maybe God's calling you to use an artistic ability that you used years ago in your past, but you stopped using today. I don't know what it is, but I believe right now God's going to speak that thing to your soul. And as we transition into this time of worship, I want you to ask God, God, what do you want to reveal to me that's going to transform my life about who you are and who I'm called to be? Lastly, in this verse that we saw, from Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus declares over Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. See, what God does when we come into a relationship with him is he redefines and reorders everything. He reveals to us who we are, who we can become in him, 
He called Peter the rock because he saw beyond all the failures and all the flaws and Peter's loud mouth and Peter's shortcomings and Peter's actually even knowing Peter would mess up and deny Jesus later in life, Jesus still called this out in him. And Jesus is still calling you, friend, to be who you he to be who he's uniquely created you to be. And as we go into worship right now, take a moment to connect with God in these ways. Hey, I love you. I'm praying for you. Let's worship together. Good, good. 
father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am, it's who I am. Stay connected to all that is happening at New Sound Church by visiting our website at www.newsoundnashville.com and also by following us on Facebook and Instagram at New Sound Nash. Most importantly, go and tell all people about this new life in Jesus Christ.